There we go. Is it there? We've been talking about how to understand the Bible. That's why you're here. Isn't that why you're in Bible school? To understand the Bible? That is one of our greatest lifelong pursuits. If the Bible is the voice of God, if it's the Word of God, if it's the way God communicates to us, God says it's more necessary than eating. So that means we should go right through lunch. Right? <laughs> if we're studying the Bible. But actually it says that. Your words were more than my necessary food. So, it's it's all important, but you notice I've added something. There's one thing we forget about, the background of who's writing these books. Remember, 40 different authors God used to write books of the Bible. There are 40 different authors that wrote over 1,600 year period of time, and each of those authors are like you. If, if I said Leo, immediately you think Japan, you think international family. His dad lives in Europe, and he's a, you know, a businessman. His mother, I mean, I, I'm getting to know you guys one time. Boy, I can tell you stories about, over the years, the most fascinating people that are in this school. What's Paul's story? Paul's story is learning to wait. Now, one thing I've learned about Korea is, watch out. The people are in a hurry. If you don't start right away at the light, or before the light, they honk. Those trucks come right up on your bumper. I mean, those big, big trucks with rocks in them or whatever they are, I never earn driving fast enough. At the elevator, we push the button and wait, and if we don't push, everyone pushes around us to get on the elevator before us. People in Korea are on the move. Paul was Korean. <laughs> he had to learn one of the hardest lessons, how to wait. How to wait. And his life, is a life of learning to wait, and that's the context. Let me just show you uh, what his life looked like. This is the lifetime of Paul. Most Bible scholars say he was probably born a couple years after Christ. Christ, Jesus, was born about 6 B.C., six years before Christ. Boy, that shows that we've changed the calendars over the years. But in our modern reckoning, the Gregorian calendar that the Pope started, Paul was born six or 4 B.C., and he was martyred near the end of the 60s, maybe 67, 68. He's saved right here in Acts 9, about AD 33. And the book of Acts, just to give you a perspective, covers that period of time from 30 to 60 AD. And so that's Paul's lifetime. Now, that doesn't mean much until you look at what is going on. Paul was probably saved about AD 33. That's what it says in Acts 9. Immediately, he tells us in Galatians, he went into Arabia and went to a Bible institute. Only it was better than Wolby. Jesus Christ himself taught him in the desert. Paul went for seminary. Read about it in Galatians. He said, I wasn't taught by anybody on earth. The Lord himself taught me. And so Paul gets saved. And do you remember what happened right after he got saved? They tried to kill him. He immediately went out into ministry in, up in Damascus. And they had to let him over the wall in a basket. Remember? You remember all this? Because he was so zealous. See, as soon as he got saved, he wanted to get out of the elevator. He was ready to go. He was honking the horn. The Lord said, no, 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 no. I'm going to take you for a couple years out in nowhere. Kind of like more remote than Jeju, okay? He was he was to be trained. And then, he doesn't go into ministry. Paul goes to Tarsus. That's what it says in Acts 9, 23 and 30. He goes, what's Tarsus? What was that town? His home. He went to his home town. Look how long he went. Seven years. See, most people, Acts 9... We don't hear about Paul anymore. It's Peter's in the, you know, Peter's the big guy. He is filling the book of Acts. Paul is where? Nowhere. He goes to school, and then he goes to Tarsus, and he's not over. He's still in Tarsus when Barnabas comes and finds him and brings him to Antioch. Do you notice? Paul trained 14 years in order to serve only 10 years. Do you know what a lot of people are? They're in a hurry. I meet people all the time. 
They don't have time to prepare for ministry. They don't have time to go to school. They don't have time to do it. They're just going to go do something right now. And they're just going to save the world. Isn't it interesting, when God directed Paul's life, he prepared him 14 years before he starts. This is the first time we really hear about Paul's ministry. It's his, what we call the first what? Missionary journey, right? It, you always learn that. The first, the second, the third missionary journey. Way over here. That's the fifth event of his life. He has 14 years. Well, is that a waste? Don't you think that's a waste? Why was Paul sidelined for 14 years when the whole world is going to hell? Right? He was one of the greatest, most effective evangelists in the history of the church. Yet God thinks of things differently than we do. We think of the human instrument and we think, oh, if we don't get, you know, Whoever on the front line, it's like a game and we're coaching it. And God owns the team. And he sees it in a much greater perspective than we ever will. So, Paul starts his missionary journeys. And then he has his second missionary journey. And look what starts coming out of the missionary journeys. Do you see what's written down here? What are those things? What do we call those? Paul's epistles. So after Paul's second missionary journey, he writes Galatians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. He goes to, and you see where we are in Acts up there. He goes to his third missionary journey, and he's in Corinth, and he's writing the book of Romans. Now, one of the greatest books ever written in the history of humanity. Paul writes from Corinth. And then, after 10 years, that's the total of all of his missionary journeys. All that we read about in the book of Acts is 10 years long. He's had 14 years invested in getting ready. 10 years in heavy duty, non-stop, walking about 3,000 miles, riding boats, getting shipwrecked, all this stuff. And then look at this. This is, this is the big part. After his third missionary journey, he has a hard, alone, suffering decade. We, we hardly think of this part. Paul goes from the center of the world, planting <coughs> the churches that today all of us are downstream from. Unless you're Jewish, almost all of us are downline from the Apostle Paul. Somebody that was ministering through his ministry is like your great, 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 great grandparent. He was the apostle to the Gentiles. So that's what we are. Do we have any Jewish people here? Any you Jewish? So Paul, now I'm, I, I run into Jewish saved people all the time, but Paul is like our great, great, great grandfather, you know, <coughs> in the faith. But after that great 10 year ministry, he starts his jail time. Caesarea, he's released after he goes to Rome the first time, released briefly, then he goes back to Rome. But look what comes out of 10 years of hard, lonely suffering. Half of all of his epistles, and maybe some of the most encouraging. Paul writes Ephesians. Where would we be without Ephesians? We studied part of that this morning. Philippians, one of the most encouraging letters he wrote. Colossians. Colossians tells us more about Christ and our fullness in Christ. And Philemon, the story of Christian love and forgiveness. And then the pastoral epistles. We're even going to be covering Titus in our family life conference. That is the only curriculum for how to disciple people no matter what culture they're from. It's the only complete discipleship manual in the Bible. And it's in the book of Titus. And Paul wrote that during his hard, alone, suffering decade. Okay. So that's an overview of Paul's life to give you an idea. So much of Paul's life was investing, serving God while he was waiting. See, most people want to get there. So isn't that what they always say? When are we going to get there? I want to get there. I want to, I want to go do something. Paul didn't have that attitude. The Lord changed him. He finally realized, he put it in Philippians chapter 4, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I'm content when I'm in school with the Lord. I'm content when I'm at home for seven years. 
I'm content when I'm second fiddle to Barnabas in Antioch. I'm content when I'm the star of Christendom in my three missionary journeys. I'm content when I'm in jail. Wow. Paul learned a lot while he was waiting. What lessons did he learn? And, and specifically, the reason I'm telling you this is to understand the Bible, you have to understand the context. And the context is God chose to, wrote, to write the Bible through people. So their life shows up in the way they write. And so to understand Paul, you have to understand his life. Number one, what's the first lesson? Study all you can because preparation is vital. What did Paul say in Philippians 3.10? Remember that famous letter to the Philippians? He says, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, if by any means I may attain unto the resurrection from the dead. He says, I have a singular goal. I want to know Christ. Don't confuse knowing facts with knowing Christ. There's a difference. Do you remember what James said? He said, demons, now we studied demons, let's see how well you were listening last hour. One third of all the angels fell into the rebellion, so there are countless demons. Do you know what James said about demons? Demons believe all the facts. Did you know demons are orthodox in the sense they believe Jesus is God? They believe he's the Son of God. They believe in the Trinity. They believe in creation. They know that Jesus rose from the dead because they saw it. You understand? They saw every one of his miracles. Have you? Were we there? No. Were they? Yes. They were bothering Jesus' his whole ministry. They witnessed everything. They believe all the facts. Demons believe. They believe more than we do because they tremble. You know, that's what it says. Demons know it's all true and they shake because they know who they're dealing with. Don't confuse facts with knowing. Knowing is to experience. Uh, in the English language, if you have an English dictionary and look up the word to know, uh, you know, Webster was the famous uh, American dictionary writer. And if you look up the word, the verb to know, it says there are three levels of meaning. Uh, there is, uh, let's see, recognition is the first level. You know, you kind of know the alphabet. Acquaintance. Is it tense or tense? I never want to spell it. Acquaintance tense or tense? That's it. Oh, good. And here's the final level. Experience. Now, what Webster said is, if I say the word hunger, hunger, and someone says, oh, I know what hunger is, that means they recognize hungry people. Or it means they're acquainted with someone that's been hungry. But he said the only ones that really know it have been hungry. They've experienced it. How about um, pain? You know how the doctor says, you know, tell me on level of 1 to 10 what that pain is like? Did you know you can recognize someone in pain? You can be acquainted with people that are in pain, but until you've felt it, you don't really know it. Did you know that many people are recognizing the truth of the Bible? Many people are acquainted with the truth of the Bible, but they don't know Christ. They're like demons. They know the facts, but they've never experienced knowing Christ. When you experience knowing Christ, it totally transforms your life. So that was first. Paul said, study all you can. Preparation is vital. Secondly, wait for God's timing because growth takes time. It took Paul seven years at home to get ready to go into ministry. He had to be around the people he grew up with, the people he knew, the people that knew him best before he could go out. And, and what he had to learn is also in Philippians. This is what Paul said in Philippians 2.15. He said, this is what I had to learn. It took so long. Philippians 2 and verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You know what Paul had to deal with? He had to deal with humbling himself. So it wasn't all about Paul. So it was about Christ. And that growth to trust in Christ takes a long time. Here's another lesson Paul had to learn. 
listen to a Barnabas because everyone needs discipleship. Paul went to school with Jesus. He still had to be discipled by Barnabas. God knew that Paul couldn't make it to ministry if he didn't have a period of time, about three plus years, that Paul was in the tutelage of Barnabas. Do you have a Barnabas? Do you have someone that disciples you? Every one of us needs someone that comes along, knows us so well, asks us the right questions, and says, what are you really learning in your Bible? What is God really changing in your life? Are you more patient than you were last year? Are you more loving than you were? How are you doing it saying no to sin in your life? See, that's the level that we need. Listen to a Barnabas. Everybody needs discipleship. The fourth lesson Paul learned is run the race because God can do so much in a short time. Uh, do you know in Philippians 3.14 Paul's metaphor, he used these athletic metaphors and he said, I press toward the mark. The word press is used outside the Bible for a chariot driver. Now all of you think of chariot drivers as a great big platform like this, the man stands on, you know, the Roman charioteers, there's this big kind of like deck of a boat, he's got reins in his hands, he's got six horses, and he's standing almost inside of a little apartment. That's not the chariot races that Paul used the word for. The chariot races that were spectatorial, the chariot driver only had a small circle the size of a dinner plate that he stood on and balanced himself because they couldn't have all that stuff because they were racing around corners and that that big apartment you were standing on would have swung too widely. So they were on a little tiny wheeled, little tiny platform, only balancing themselves, holding on to the, the reins. And the only way that they could stay in tune is they had to press forward, holding on to those reins so that they were exactly in stride with the horses. Paul says, I am completely leaning into the race for Christ. And you know what he did in 10 years? He changed the whole world. He wrote half the New Testament, planted all the churches that most of us are a part of, and then he went to jail. Run the race in God's timing because God can do so much in a short time. Fifthly, learn contentment because God can use us anywhere. He had six plus years in prison that we're aware of and time in between, kind of like house arrest, for a whole decade. And you know what Paul said in Philippians 4.11? I've learned in whatever state, you might add whatever jail, whatever confinement that I'm in, to be content. There's an English song that's very interesting. Uh, those of you that might be old enough to have heard this. It used to be on Billy Graham. Um, all the time, his crusades. His eye is on the sparrow. There's a little couple that lived in Elmira, New York, in a rest home, a nursing home. And the person that wrote this hymn was visiting in the nursing home, and they walked down the row, and they looked into this room, and there was this little couple, and they didn't have any pictures in their apartment, they didn't have any fancy stuff on the wall, it was just a little couple with a little chair and a table, and they were old. And the person knocked on the door, and he says, Hello, I'm from the so-and-so church, and wonder how you're doing. I'm from Elmira. And they go, Oh, we're doing great. And they said, You don't have any pictures. They said, Oh, we don't have any family. Never had any children. We don't have any relatives. They said, Does anybody visit you here in the nursing home? They said, No, no. And they, they talked to them for quite a while. Finally, they said, Why are you you're so chipper? You know, kind of so happy. And this dear couple said, why should we be discouraged? If the Lord, his eyes on the sparrow, we know he cares for us. And that's where the words from the song came from. What this couple learned is, learn to be content because God can use us anywhere. What they said they did is they sat in their little nursing home and all they had is a window. And they would look out the window and they had learned to pray for missionaries around the world. They said, we can see all the way around the world out our window. They just, they were just aware that God was listening to their prayers, that He had put them at that time in their life in that nursing home. They were so happy someone cooked for them and cleaned their, their sheets and everything else. Did you know, 
Contentment is something we learn. It isn't a spiritual gift. It's not one of the fruits of the Spirit. Have you checked? Love, joy, peace, right? It's not one of them. It's a choice. And there can be Christians who don't enjoy anything because they've never learned to be content. They're discontent their whole life. Paul said, hey, I have learned to be content. And look what that did with his life. You know one thing you ought to do in your year here? You ought to say, Lord, I would like to learn to be content. Don't think if you get somewhere else, you'll be happy. Or if you meet someone else, or marry someone else, or get a perfect job. Right? That's how people are. And they're discontent through life. Here's the last lesson. Book. Come on. There we go. Love Jesus more than everything. Because no one is indispensable. Do you know what that means? Indispensable? It means God doesn't need you. He can use anybody. When God couldn't find the right prophet to speak, he used a donkey, right? Balaam's donkey. God can use anything he wants. Be thankful if he uses us. We're not dispensable. So love Jesus more than anything else because a time is going to come in your life when you're not needed by anybody on earth and not seen by anybody on earth. And you gradually get so that you're almost forgotten. Like Paul was in prison. He was lonely. He was facing death. And you know what he said? I love the Lord. I'm going to get the crown for those that love his appearing. And he says, nobody knows where I am. My time is almost up. He told Timothy, I'm going to be poured out like a drink offering. Everything's going to end, but it doesn't matter because I love the Lord. Love Jesus more than everything else in life. Because sooner or later, you're not going to be young. You're not going to be in school. You're not going to have someone paying your way. You're not going to have a big job to look forward to. You're not going to have all your electronic stuff to have fun with. You're going to be old, and you won't be able to see. You won't be able to hear. You'll lose your mobility. You'll lose most of your money. People don't like to care for you. <coughs> old age, according to Ecclesiastes 12, is hard. That's why it says, remember your Creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come. How do you get ready for the evil days, as it's called? Love Jesus more than everything else. That's the one thing we can't take away from you. It's what we have that lasts forever. Well, there they all are. Study all you can. Wait for God's timing. Listen to Barnabas. Run the race. Learn contentment. Love Jesus most. The bottom line of Paul's life, he was waiting on God. He was trusting the Lord's plan. And he served him anywhere. That's the author of half the New Testament. And to understand the four, or the 13 epistles that he wrote, the context is that they flow from that life that God used as one of the authors of his scripture. Let's bow for a word of prayer and it's time to go to uh, lunch. But let's ask the Lord to uh, teach us a lesson. Father, I pray that we would love your appearing like Paul did, that we would that we would learn to be content. And I pray some of these young people would learn to wait. That they wouldn't be in a hurry, that they wouldn't think that, that they've got to do everything right now, that they would take the time to know you and the power of your resurrection. And to get a Barnabas to disciple them until they can disciple the rest of their life others. But I pray that we would love you most. And no matter what you do with our life, no matter where you put us, we would love you most. And like Paul, finish the race that you have given us. In the name of Jesus we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Try it again. All God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless you.